All right. Hi, everyone. We are live. Welcome to Market Matters. My name is Katie Kuntz, and I'm a social media editor here at CNBC. I'm joined, as always, by our senior markets correspondent, Bob Pisani. And today we're going to be answering all of your questions about the latest stock market moves. Nice to see you, Bob. Hi, Katie. How is Los Angeles? Katie's moved to Los Angeles, folks, in case you don't know, but she used to be a New Yorker and now she's a Los Angelino. How is yeah. it? It's been good so far. Yeah, I've been pretty busy the last few weeks moving out here, um, but it's fun getting to explore a new city and see a new place. It's a wonderful city. I think you're going to have a great time there. Yes, I'm definitely excited. Um, so happy to be here. Happy to see you, Bob. And we have a lot to talk about. Um, so let's jump right into everything. Um, first up, Bob, just what has been driving stocks recently? Well, the most important thing is interest rates, um, because that's changing everything. So interest rates have been going up. You, you've been hearing about people getting 5% on their money market funds, 5% on the one-year treasuries. Uh, rates have been going up for several reasons. There's a macro reasons. The economy is still strong. Um, and the Fed has been aggressively raising interest rates and said they will keep rates higher for longer. The betting right now is the Fed is probably done or at least one more rate hike at a quarter point, but basically done, but they're gonna keep rates higher for longer. So there's a macro reason why things are stronger. Um, if there was a real economic downturn, you'd see people going to, to bonds a little bit more, and I think rates would come down, but that's not happening right now. There's also a supply demand issue with the bond market. The treasury department has been issuing massive amounts of new um, debt to fund all these initiatives that it's been trying to do, the government's been trying to do. Um, so there's a much bigger supply coming. Uh, second is the uh, demand side. There's fewer buyers of the debt. So the Chinese and the Japanese, for example, were very big buyers of our debt. About one third of all the treasury debt is held by foreign entities, um, including the Chinese and the Japanese. So there's a problem here. Uh, and the, the issue is whether or not whether the supply demand issue is going to affect the overall. And I think it does to a certain extent. It's hard to put your finger on it, but just think about this. More supply, fewer buyers means lower prices and higher yields. Just you no know, normal thing here that you'd be expecting. So the important thing is um, how is that impacting things? And it, what it means is it's increasing the cost of buying. Uh, it's increasing the cost of borrowing dramatically for everybody. Um, so uh, you think about the impact on mortgages, for example. Uh, think about seven, eight percent mortgages when they were three or four uh, percent. Think about the cost of borrowing for corporate America going up. Think about the cost of the federal government, about eight percent. Uh, of our of our outlays is paying the debt off. But when they go up, those rates go up, it's going to be a problem. And it's an issue right now. The government's going to have to spend a lot more money servicing the debt. So instead of 8% of uh, you know, the outlays budget going to pay the debt might be 10, 12, 14%. So this is rippling through the whole overall economy. So if you ask me, what's the one thing that matters is interest rates and getting them to level off is really important. Now, whenever they go up, notably like they did yesterday, we had a crummy bond auction, market goes down. So there's a very clear relationship here. All right, Bob. Um, next up, today is the deadline for the SEC to decide whether they are going to appeal a ruling for a spot Bitcoin ETF. Um, where does the SEC stand um, on this matter? Well, I'll tell you... Uh, Hold on one second. People are asking me something. Um, the, um, the important thing is right now, this is a deadline today. So they have until midnight to decide whether they're going to appeal a ruling that went against them. Um, so you remember this Grayscale Investments, they have a Bitcoin trust. It's sort of like a closed end fund. They want to convert it to a Bitcoin ETF. The SEC has said no. They took them to court and Grayscale won. What the court said was, okay, you guys, the SEC, you have allowed a Bitcoin futures ETF to exist, and there is one. They approved several of them. But you haven't allowed a spot Bitcoin product to exist. Wait a minute. A Bitcoin futures ETF and a spot Bitcoin product are the same thing. They're like 
you prove one of them, therefore you have to approve the other one. It was really that simple. And they kind of got caught in a logic trap. So now they have the right to appeal this to, a, to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals and say, well, <laughs> uh, you've, uh, you've, you've made a misstatement here or you misunderstood what's going on. That would be the grounds. So the question is, the problem for the SEC is the ruling was unanimous. So they'd have to go back to the, the, the court, basically said, you guys are all wrong. They have to say you overlooked something or you didn't understand something, or they'd have to come up with some new and novel reason they didn't use before to turn them down. This is a kind of a high barrier to cut across. So the betting right now is they'll do nothing. And if they do nothing, if they do decide not to appeal, the court order will stand and they will have to find some way to approve this. And that's at least the thinking right now. And there are eight other ones at last count applications for a Bitcoin ETF, a spot Bitcoin ETF that are out there. And there's a lot of speculation. They're going to approve all of them at once sometime in the next few months. So if I had to bet, I would say that the betting is that we will get a spot Bitcoin ETF uh, in the next few months. Uh, I have said many times I am totally neutral on Bitcoin. I have no opinion on the price of Bitcoin. I'm not entirely convinced that Bitcoin is a really convincing use case, but there are people who want to use it. Uh, and I think a spot Bitcoin is ETF is a far safer vehicle because it deals with a lot of the custodial problems. It deals with some of the fraud problems and forgetting the password problems. So I think that it's the time has probably come for it. Uh, and that's probably a good thing. And I think they'll probably just say nothing tonight and let this whole thing just sort of happen in the next few months. Yeah, it'll definitely be interesting to watch, you know, if a few not, a few months from now, you know, if we have a spot Bitcoin ETF. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of people watching this closely. Um, next up, Bob, what should investors be watching this earnings season? We got bank earnings. Um, you know, what should we be watching? Well, you see what happened today. We we had earnings uh, and the numbers were generally good for the big banks, JP Morgan, City, Wells Fargo. Um, and it's not just them. We've had close to 30 companies report third quarter numbers already, including Pepsi this week. Uh, and not only is there no earnings recession, earnings falling apart, that's not happening. The S&P are actually going up. So remember, with the stock market, what matters is the direction of earnings estimates. It doesn't matter like, oh, earnings are 2% higher for the third quarter than they were last year. The question is, what's the direction, the delta? Are earnings the trend going up for estimates overall, or is the trend going down? And you can get very granular. I look at it at the S&P 500 level. When you're dealing with 500 companies, what's the trend? Um, but you can look at it on a sectoral level. You can say, what's the trend in technology earnings? What's the tre trend in bank earnings? Or an individual level, what's the trend in JP Morgan's, Morgan's earnings? Um, but the, the big macro trend is earnings are not only not going down, they're going up for the third and the fourth quarter and the first quarter next year. Well, that's a, a good sign because a lot of people looked at what was going on recently with rates going up and said, oh, this is really going to pressure the consumer. And it is. Absolutely, it's going to. The question is whether how much is it really going to hurt corporate America and the consumers? And right now, there is no recession. This, this time last year, we all were convinced there was going to be a recession right now that we were in the middle of. And that has not happened. And the earnings are not reflecting a, re a recession. So all of this is good news. We've got a whole bunch of companies already comment, not, not just JP Morgan, but you know, Delta, Fastenal, um, AutoZone, Lennar, Costco. None of it indicates a recession. There is some pressure on the lower end consumer because their savings get depleted a little earlier and high inflation kind of weighs on them a little more. So that's been a problem. We've seen Dollar General, uh, Walmart make comments along this line. But for the overall economy, still holding up pretty well and job growth is still pretty good. So I would watch for signs of demand slowing down with the consumer. I would watch for, uh, in particular, we know what the low end consumer is doing, but um, watch for slowing signs of spending. Uh, I think that's going to happen. I think it already is happening to a certain extent, but it's perfectly normal in a higher interest rate environment. Um, the question is whether it tips into a very serious recession or earnings start dropping more seriously. So far, that hasn't happened. The early reporters 
are very good. I expect to hear more cautious commentary about consumers, but they always do that. They're all, remember this game with these companies is to always try to be cautious, have lower the bar and then beat the bar. And that's what they traditionally do. You traditionally do a little bit better in the end than the expectation was. And it's almost built into the stock market that you'll have a small, it's about 3%, somewhere around there, where overall where you'll, the numbers will be a little bit higher. Um, the, so everyone understands that. The question is, are we going in that direction? Is that the way we're going? So far, actually, it is. So far, all the naysayers have been wrong. Now, someday, somebody's going to be right, and we're going to have a recession. Duh. I mean, that's been the whole history of the United States. So nobody's wrong for saying that. Uh, it's not a very bold statement to make. Oh, we're going to have a recession someday. But so far, everybody's been wrong about this at least the timing of this recession. It hasn't happened. We thought we were going to be in one right now. It hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I feel like we've been talking about this for a long time and it's forever. Still forever. We've yep. been, a year and a half, we've been waiting for the recession. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll continue to watch how earnings season plays out. We're just getting started. Um, next up, Bob, something else that our audience is always very interested in talking about, which is generative AI, um, chat GPT. So how do you think chat GPT will impact the economy? Well, the most important thing about these devices is productivity improvement. So th this is artificial intelligence, as we're talking about it, as a chat bot, chat GPT, is just the latest iteration of new technologies that have been going on for 100 years. In, in the 1990s, um, and when I became the stocks correspondent in the mid 1990s, the big thing was the internet. Netscape went public in August 1995. It was the first real big browser, and that was a sensation. I mean, it was just that kicked off the internet revolution from 95 to 2000. Everybody went nuts about the internet. Now a lot of it was garbage. Remember Pets.com? You know, selling cat food. You know, on the internet, uh, and you didn't have to pay postage. <laughs> 12 pound bag of cat food <laughs> and you didn't have to pay the post. They went under because it was a, the public didn't want to buy cat food through the mail. <laughs> but so there was a lot of nonsense around it. But overall, the Internet changed the world. Then we had software coming in the big way in the 2000s, software as a service. So, you know, people forget that in these companies, they used to have accounting departments. They did everything on paper. Now all this stuff is electronic. This is, this is all 20 years old. There's all sorts of new technological revolutions constantly coming through that will improve productivity. Uh, and now we have another one, this chat GPT. Uh, and the numbers are quite amazing. You know, it's largely it's about half owned by Microsoft and then privately owned. They're, they may have a new round of funding with a $90 billion valuation. That's a big company. Uh, most of their money comes from subscriptions still. But it's got to be more than chatbots. You know, the question is, what's the real killer application of this thing? Right now, they're just people... And it's a little more efficient than Google. I'll tell you what I think is the real killer app for these things on a software level. I have been waiting for 15 years for a personal digital assistant. I call it Bob 2.0. So imagine you've got your, you know, here's your iPhone, right? So imagine the iPhone is also a, a, a it, it's an app and the app is Bob 2.0. It basically knows you. So I say, look, uh, I want to see Billy Joel at the Madison Square Garden, what's available. And in two seconds, it can show me the seating map of Madison Square Garden. So you pick it here. Now, I can do this online now, but it takes me 20 minutes to figure it out. What if it was available immediately? What if this is simple things? What if I, I want to go to uh, I want to fly to Boston to see my brother? Uh, what's available this Saturday? Um, you know, Chat GPT has some very interesting applications. But when, when you start dealing with you personally, help me out, where am I going? And it becomes sort of part of you and even starts talking to you, which is when it'll get really creepy. That's a real killer application. People are gonna become very dependent on that very quickly to do things because it'll be a time saver for a lot of people. And all of a sudden, I always say by 2025, I keep saying this, I've been putting it off, for, I've been wrong by the years, but by 2025, 30% uh, of the adult population will name a personal digital assistant as their best friend. Um, and because it'll actually know you. Um, and again, there's got a creepy implications about that. But people will adopt it because that is a killer app. 
That's really useful. Somebody who can tell me exactly the perfect route. Now, I know you can do this now to get anywhere, but can actually stand there and sit with you and say, do this, go, go do that. And I would, I would use that for a very large amount. I already use a certain amount of AI to do research. Um, I use it uh, to, for example, help summarize complicated documents sometimes. That's useful. Uh, you have to have confidence that they'll be able to summarize it properly. But, you know, there's use cases for this. But I think the personal digital, that, that's what I would vote for. If you say, what's the killer app? I mean, when I just go sit here and chat on a chat bot with some artificial intelligence, that's not a killer app. Personal digital assistant, that's a killer app. Yeah, I think we're definitely getting closer to Bob 2.0 becoming a reality. So um, lots lots developing here. I know something that our audience is very interested in and something we'll be continuing to talk about as we go forward. Um, but last up, Bob, it's been about a year since your book, uh, Shut Up and Keep Talking, was uh, published. So um, congratulations on that. What do you think is the most valuable lesson for investors from your book? Well, if I have one thing, the, the, the book is a little bit about my uh, my history at CNBC, a little bit about the history of CNBC, and a little bit about the history of the New York Stock Exchange. I've been very blessed to work for CNBC, a wonderful company, for 33 years. I'm the last of the Mohicans, the last of the original hires in the first year. And, uh, I felt the need to just summarize what I think I knew and learned. Uh, the publisher, of course, some uh, fun celebrity stories around all these bell ringings, the opening and closing. So I, I chapters about meeting Aretha Franklin or Robert Downey Jr. Uh, or Warren Buffett and all, all about my meetings with those people. But primarily it was pointers on what I think I know about the markets and investing. And if there was anything I would say is the single most important thing is to understand yourself when you're an investor. You have to understand not just how old you are, but how long your investment horizon is. So if you're 30 years old, you're going to probably live to 100. That's 70 years. That's hard for you to understand. But what happened this year isn't going to matter over a 70-year horizon. So people say to me, oh, my God, the stock market dropped 20% last year. I can't handle that. Well, my question to you is, first of all, how long are you going to live? If you're 30 years old and you're investing, last year is not going to matter <laughs> over the course of time. Believe me, it's not. It's already up 13% this year. So you have to have an understanding of how old you are, how long you think you're going to live, what your risk tolerance is going to be. I mean, you're biting your nails because it's down 20 percent. You think you're going to lose everything. You don't have a very good perspective on history. But you should understand if you can't, well, then you should limit the amount of investing you do in the stock market and maybe stay in, in bonds or maybe buy real estate. You need to understand yourself a little bit. The other thing you need to understand is most of what you think you can do, you can't. So people ask me all the time about what do I think about Microsoft? What do I think about Apple? What do I think about Europe? Most of the time, your opinion doesn't mean much. That's a little hard for you to swallow, but it's true. Most of the time, what matters is staying in the market, not trying to time the market, not saying, oh, I hear Apple's going to be really great next quarter. And everybody who says that to me, I look at them and say, what information do you think you possess that nobody else has? Please tell me. And when you frame it that way, they look at you and say, uh, nothing. I just kind of thought, well, your thought is probably not a good idea on how to invest. It's really not. What you want to do is try stop trying to guess the markets, stop trying to guess individual stocks, and stay with the market long term. Jack Bogle, who founded Vanguard, on the principle that you should stay invested and not try to do market timing because it doesn't work. Market timing assumes that you know when to get into a stock, when to get out of stock, or when to get into an index and out of an index. And you don't. You have two entry, two points where you can be wrong. Almost everybody's wrong on this. So staying with the market is the most, single most important thing overall. And you have to, here's the game. You have to actually believe in the capital. There is, a, there is an assumption here. The assumption is that over the last 100 years, this is a fact, not an assumption, the stock market outperforms the bond market, but not every year. And there have been periods where the bond market does better. However, 
in the course of time, over long periods, the stock market outperforms. About 10% a year it goes up, about 7 8%, then 2% dividend. And you reinvest it is the real key, the dividend. If you, if you don't believe that, if you don't believe in the capital system, why does this happen, by the way? Why does the stock market tend to go up? It tends to go up because the nature of the capitalist system Capitalism, as it's practiced in the United States, allows individuals and corporations to control the means of production. They make their own decisions. The government doesn't tell them what to do. As a result, because of this, it's self-interest. And so corporations and individuals are very ruthless, efficient allocators of capital, better than if the government was doing. And because of that, the profits tend to be than elsewhere. So for example, France is a capitalist country. It's also a democracy like the United States. But in France, a, there's a little more of the means of production controlled by the government in various sectors. In, cap, in my opinion, this makes generally, uh, it, it, th that kind of allocation is less efficient when you have government making the decisions on investing, less efficient than individuals and companies. So the U.S. tends, not always, but tends to outperform Europe. China, on the other hand, is a, a, a total, not a totalitarian, it's an authoritarian government. Uh, so it is not a democracy, but the cap, the system, the, the economic system is kind of strange. It's, there's quasi-capitalist elements, but the government controls most of the means of production, even in publicly traded companies, particularly banks, they're effectively controlled by the government, even though there's private investment. So that's a bit of a problem. Um, when the government can ultimately step in, even when there's you know public shareholders and ultimately have an influence, that changes the way the market tends to operate. So the US is a better system. I, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because that's the assumption that you have to have to believe in investing in the stock market. If you don't believe the United States has any economic future or we're gonna to go to hell, then it's, you know, it's a bad idea to invest in the stock market. Um, so it, there is a certain amount of uh, belief in the system that you have to engage in mentally to, to, to believe this. So believe in the future, be an optimist. Don't listen to the pessimists. We're all living a lot longer. World is getting better despite all these terrible conflicts. Uh, don't think you can time the markets. Don't try to do that, uh, and stay invested in the long, in, in the long run. Uh, and I know people like to exhaust themselves trying to figure out what stock's going to outperform what one. I have been doing this for thirty three years, and I sort of stopped worrying about that a long time ago by staying broadly with the market. And by the way, if you want to know what I own, it's in the book. Shut up and keep talking. There's an entire chapter about my whole history of investing, some of it disastrous, stupid in the 1990s, including my disastrous investment in General Electric stock. I describe the whole thing. And at the end, I tell you what I own. It's not that interesting. <laughs> you should not be surprised to hear I own mostly index funds. S&P 500 is the core holding that I have, which is the most rational thing that you can possibly do. So take a look at the book if you're interested. And thank you for asking for it. It's about it. It's been a very interesting uh, writing uh, a book summarizing uh, your life and what you think you know. It's a very interesting exercise. Yeah, well, it's a huge accomplishment. Um, I know you've seen a lot of changes throughout your time with CNBC and at the Stock Exchange. Um, we've talked about this before, you know, long-term investing. It should be kind of boring, maybe, if you're, you know, in it for the long run. Um, so, you know, that's exactly the, that's exactly the problem that you you hit it right on the head. It's boring. When I show people my portfolio, you could, you could put it on an index card. It's not that complicated. Mm -hmm. People say this, you own this. You're the senior markets correspondent, thirty three years, and you own you know the S and P five hundred index fund. You don't. They they keep waiting for me to say something startling, like I own you know leveraged inverse Malaysia silliness. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't. Mm -hmm. and, you don't have to. You don't need to. You, people think that they, you know, have these amazing things, but you really don't. Jack Bogle used to, who founded Vanguard, knew this and said, "Look, we know this is going to be boring, but if you think you're a genius, go ahead, take ten percent of your portfolio and go ahead and invest it on your own. You're probably going to find out." Bogle said, 
that you're not going to outperform. If you know how to actually measure your performance, including the cost and the time you're spending, you're not going to outperform the market. But Bogle knew, he called scratching the itch, that some people just want to do that, just like they want to bet on the, the Eagles game uh, or they want, to, they want to bet on lotteries. What's a lottery? A lottery is a tax on poor people. That's what it is. Lower income people use lotteries. So, I mean, that's terrible. We know what the odds are. You're just giving money to the government. But people want to do it. Should I stand there, cross my arms and say, no, no, you shouldn't do a lottery because I think it's a dumb idea. No, but I say it's a dumb idea. Um, the same with heavy sports betting. People lose on it all the time. Most of the time they lose. And the same with trying to trade the stock market every single day. There are a few people who can do it, but not many. Most people staying with the market is how to win. That's what I do. And it's a winner. Trust me. I'm testimony to that fact. But do I go standing around saying, oh, no, you people who bet on sports, you shouldn't be doing that. You people bet on the lottery shouldn't do that. You people who trade stocks all day long in and out, you shouldn't be doing that. No, you don't get paternalistic. Nobody wants to hear you, you know, acting like, you know, a cranky uncle. Tell them what you think the truth is, but, you know, give people the freedom to do what they want. So that's kind of the way I look at it. Yeah, definitely. Well, a lot of great lessons in your book, a lot of great, you know, fun stories, like you said, too, of the people that you've met. So congratulations on a year. And um, yeah, we'll talk again soon. Thanks, everyone, for submitting your questions. Thank you, Bob, for answering them. Um, Market Matters is by Coastal now, which is very exciting. So um, we'll talk again in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Katie. Thanks, everybody. Great questions as usual. Bye.